Welcome to Lesson 4a, The Material Derivative. In this lesson, we'll compare the Lagrangian to the Eulerian description. We'll derive and explain the material acceleration and extend it to the material derivative in general. And we'll do an example problem. There are two primary ways to describe a fluid flow. The first one is the Lagrangian description. In this description, we follow and keep track of individual fluid particles as functions of time. Let's consider two fluid particles, particle A. The location of particle A is given by xA, where xA is a vector, similarly with particle B. The velocity of A is VA, also a vector, and the velocity of B is VB. As particle A moves around, its position vector is a function of time, similarly for particle B. If we know these functions, we can calculate the velocity of a particle by taking the derivative. So VA and VB are also functions functions of time. So the Lagrangian description boils down to keeping track of these variables xA and xB as functions of time. For example, billiard balls banging together. In high school physics we did these kinds of experiments where we documented the position vectors of a couple billiard balls. We just track each ball and see where they go. The physics is relatively simple. We just apply conservation of momentum and energy, etc., directly to each billiard ball. The problem in fluid mechanics is we don't really have individual particles. Rather, we have a continuum flow. If we were to try to do this in a fluid flow, it would be impractical to track billions of fluid particles. So the Lagrangian description is not often used for fluid flow, although I should point out that some sophisticated computer codes do use a Lagrangian description, but they require supercomputers for practical problems. The second common description is called the Eulerian description. Instead of following individual fluid particles, we identify a region of the flow called a control volume, and we watch the fluid pass through it. For example, take some flow along a wall, and we're interested in this region or control volume. In particular, we're interested in the velocity vector, for example, at some point x, y, z, and if it's unsteady, also at some time t. At other points in the flow, the velocity vector may be different in both magnitude and direction. So instead of following fluid particles, we describe flow field variables, like velocity and pressure, as functions of space and time. For example, the velocity field would be velocity as a function of x, y, z, and t. Similarly, we can define a pressure field, p as a function of x, y, z, and t. Notice here that p is a scalar, whereas v is a vector, but they're both flow field variables. In the Eulerian description, we don't care about individual fluid particles. We just care about the fluid that happens to be in our control volume at a given time. The Eulerian description is usually preferred in fluid mechanics, but it can be more difficult to come up with these flow field variables, and we have to be careful how we apply the laws of physics. This leads us to a discussion of something called the material derivative and the material acceleration. I'll derive the material acceleration and then extend it to a general material derivative. This is some fluid particle. At some time t it has a velocity and an acceleration which is not necessarily in the same direction. The goal of this analysis is to transform a particle, which is a Lagrangian description, into a field variable, a of x, y, z, and t, which is an Eulerian description. The fundamental physics is based on this Lagrangian description, but we want to work in an Eulerian description. The fundamental definition of acceleration of a particle is a particle is dv particle dt. Again, this is a Lagrangian description. But this velocity vector of this particular particle at this particular time is the same as the velocity field at this given location and time. Mathematically, at x particle, y particle, and z particle, and at the given time, the fluid particle moves with the fluid by definition. The particle velocity is a function of time, but it's also a function of the location of the particle as a function of time. So we have to invoke the chain rule because we have four independent variables, these four variables. Quick review of the chain rule. Let's do a simple case of f as a function of t and s. Then df dt is del f del t, dt dt plus del f del s ds dt. dt dt is just one, so we have del f del t plus del f del s ds dt. Let's apply this to a fluid particle. The acceleration of a particle is dv of the particle dt, and v itself is a function of x, y, and z of the particle 
particle and time. So we use our chain rule just like we did up here. dv particle dt is del v del t dt dt plus del v del x particle dx particle dt plus similar terms for y and z. Again, dt dt is just one. dx particle dt is the x component of velocity, which is u. Similarly, dy particle dt is v and dz particle dt is w. So the acceleration of a fluid particle is dv dt, and this equation reduces to del v del t plus u del v del x plus v del v del y plus w del v del z. This is the expression for the acceleration of a fluid particle. Now we make an argument at the instant in time under consideration. The acceleration field at this location in time, given by x, y, z, and t, is equal to the acceleration of the particle at that same x, y, z, and t, where the right-hand side is the acceleration of the fluid particle that happens to be occupying this location at this time, since the fluid particle moves with the fluid flow by definition. So using our equation above, we can write an expression for the acceleration field. A is equal to dv dt, or del v del t, plus u del v del x, plus v del v del y, plus w del v del z, where the velocity field has three components, u, v, and w, in Cartesian coordinates. And u, v, and w are functions of space and time themselves. So we have achieved our goal of writing the acceleration field as a function of x, y, z, and t, space and time. This is now a field variable in the Eulerian description. Now let's define a material derivative. Since this is a special derivative, we give it a special symbol. Namely, we use capital D instead of small d to indicate the material derivative of the velocity in this case. This capital D just emphasizes that this is a total derivative, d dt, but it's made up of these four parts in Cartesian coordinates. So we rewrite our acceleration vector as capital DV dt, which is equal to del V del t, the first term. And you recall from math class that these three terms simplify to V dot del operating on V. This del is a vector representing the gradient operator, as we've seen in a previous lesson. In Cartesian coordinates, the del operator or the gradient operator is del x, del y, del z. These are the three components of the vector. It's an operator because it has to operate on some variable here. So continuing our equation, we have the dot product between velocity and del, and this combined operator is operating on v itself. This is thus the material derivative of the velocity, which is the acceleration. Physically, this material derivative represents the time derivative formed by following a fluid particle as it moves in the flow. Although we derived this material derivative for velocity, the material derivative itself can operate on any fluid property. So in general, the material derivative is d dt of something is del del t of that something plus the operator v dot del of that something. I'll just put a squiggly cloud to indicate the something, the fluid property or variable that we're operating on. This first term is the local part due to unsteadiness, and this second part is the advective or convective part due to movement to a different part of the flow. I prefer the word advective instead of convective since convective is often associated with heat transfer. When you split it up this way, you see that we have an unsteady part and an advective part. Notice that in a steady flow, which means there's no change of anything with time, or del del t is zero. So this local part is zero, but we can still have the advective part, but d dt of whatever can be non-zero, even in a steady flow. This is an important concept, and I'll give both a physical example and a mathematical example of this. First, a physical example. Consider steady converging duct flow. We're talking about a section of duct where the walls of the duct converge. Let x be to the right and the flow is to the right. At the entrance to this duct, we have a velocity profile that looks like this. Notice the no slip condition at the walls. But some fluid particle in this duct is definitely accelerating because by the time we get to the exit plane, the speed is much higher. Let's call these speeds u1 and u2 near the center line. So u2 is greater than u1. So obviously, the fluid particle accelerates from 1 to 2. In other words, A is not 0, even though this flow is steady. That's a physical example of this concept that we mentioned here. 
Now I'll do a mathematical example. Suppose we're given a steady two-dimensional velocity field, V of x, y, with these two components. This is a steady velocity field, and in two dimensions, it has two velocity components, u and v. So comparing this term to this term, u equal 3x, and comparing these two terms, v equal negative 3y. We want to calculate the acceleration field, which will also be a function of x and y. The solution is to calculate a, which is dv dt. The uninformed student will look at this velocity field and say v is not a function of time, so the acceleration is zero. But this is not true. As we showed in our physical example, a can be non-zero even for a steady flow field. The correct solution is to use the material derivative. So a is dv dt, and let's expand it out as del v del t plus u del v del x plus v del v del y plus w del v del z. In this example, v is not a function of time, so the local or unsteady acceleration is zero since the flow is steady. Here w and any changes with z are also zero since this is a 2D flow. But these two other terms need to be accounted for. We plug in our u, which is 3x, and from here del v del x is 3i, where i is the unit vector in the x direction. So this term becomes 3x times 3i. Similarly, this term becomes v, which is negative 3y, times negative 3j, which is del v del y. Thus we have our result, a equal 9xi plus 9yj. This is our acceleration field. Notice that a is not zero, even though this flow is steady. This is often a hard concept for students to grasp. It might help if you think of it this way. This acceleration field is the acceleration following a fluid particle. As that fluid particle moves around in the flow, it has an acceleration since its velocity changes as it moves in the x and y directions. So the acceleration is not zero, as we also showed in our physical example of the converging duct. From the particle's point of view, it's accelerating. Finally, this material derivative can be applied to any flow variable or property. For example, we can write out dp dt, the material derivative of pressure. This would indicate how the pressure changes as you follow a fluid particle through the flow field. For a compressible flow, you might want to consider d rho dt. This material derivative of density indicates how the density changes as the fluid particle moves around in the flow. You can do the same for temperature or any other variable. This material derivative will become very important in our later analysis of fluid flows. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.